Hello, Hunters! Today I have some bad news that will probably upset a lot of people, and it certainly raised some concerns of my own. Not the least of which, micropayment transactions are all but confirmed for Wilds. But what if I told you that you could impact the way Wilds takes shape? You think that's air you're breathing now? Or what if I told you that you have the ability to change the outcome before it's too late? One thing I do want to address before we begin is a rumored leak that's been trending on Twitter this week by user PC Focus. In it was an alleged leak from Dusk Golem purporting a fully open world, limitless creative direction for Yuya Tokuda, scrapped ideas for Monster Hunter World, as well as the return of Zora Magdaros. Let's put this to bed real quick. Dusk Golem has come forward on Twitter to clarify that the screenshot is fake, stating, quote, I thought I should shoot that one down before people buy into it, only to get their hopes shot down." End quote. Now this comes off the tail coat of my last video, where we discussed the Hunter's Choice poll and some of the feelings surrounding its results. We had a chance to analyze those results and just how much the 5th Fleet had an impact. But there were a few takeaways from the outcome that I didn't discuss, and they were telling. Most of the videos I create seek to find patterns in Capcom's trailers, interviews, dev cycles, and imagery. But this isn't the only way to source information to build theories. This video is going to be tackling two distinct, but related, subjects. Your comments, and why they're more important than ever. This video isn't just bad news, so hold on to that thought for a moment. By the way, did you know I'm giving away a copy of Monster Hunter Wilds? It's just a small way to say thank you to the awesome Monster Hunter community and to help share in the excitement. I'll be announcing the winner when the game comes available for pre-order, and I'll deliver the game at release via Game Key, Steam Gift, or PayPal in the USD amount of the base version of the game. The Gleam link is in the description below, so get your entries in while you can, and make sure to sub to stay up to date. Now, let's get back to the fun. The Game Awards make for a pretty spectacular evening for me. My wife and I tend to watch every year as part of our holiday tradition, and for the most part, it's just something fun to do. Another part of our holidays is breaking out Monster Hunter World and staying up late into the night, hunting alongside one another as partners in our next challenge. So on December 7th, 2023, we got a treat that neither of us were expecting. 90 seconds of a debut trailer played out before us, Capcom's name faded in, and my wife and I both erupted in our seats when Monster Hunter Wilds splashed onto our screens. Needless to say, I was hooked, and it was in pouring over the short 90 seconds that I started thinking about how Wilds could take shape. As I started making videos discussing these ideas, I quickly realized I wasn't alone. You, me, and plenty of the other members of the Monster Hunter community were all buzzing with their own thoughts on what all this could mean. Things we liked, things we disliked, things we hoped would return, monsters we wanted to see, and so much of the Monster Hunter lore all dominating the comments. There's a frontier of limitless potential to see one of our favorite franchises come to life in a whole new way. So remember when I said that patterns, trailers, and interviews weren't the only ways to build theories? Well, it's true. Another amazing way to build them is by crowdsourcing those ideas. I have my own opinions and perspectives, sure, but for every idea I have, there are hundreds if not thousands more. I can't compare to the sheer millions of players out there all with their own ideas in store as well. Many of you have introduced your own ideas and flavors of interpretations, examining the very same 90 seconds I was, and created discussions of your own simply by engaging with fellow hunters in the comments. To illustrate just how we as a community have run with these ideas, Blades of Elysian mentions theories around the First Fleet, where we're at the frontier of an unknown land and blazing our very first trail. The Guy0992, on the other hand, took it further back than that, suggesting the main character could be a survivor from Shrade, embarking on a quest to understand Fatalis and the war that brought the castle to ruin. Stormer JC9493 instead believes that we might get more clarity on the Tale of the Five lore from World, or at least, the presence of a subterranean world where we could have more exposure to Wyvarians, Trovarians, or some other ancient civilization. B3638, that's three E's by the way, added onto this idea, suggesting that the lightning rods featured in the trailer might be power sources for a perpetual shock trap hidden underneath the surface, keeping a monstrous snake sealed underground. Dalamadur making a reprisal in wilds, maybe? But it was the mention of the circular rock formation that really got me thinking. Tatsumi Uchiha 5559 really sent this idea home, tying the lightning rods to a circuit directly connected to the helical rock face at the end of Wild's trailer. 
Their comments suggest that rods and rock formations were once a complete circuit that powered a great weapon. Struffy the Clown had similar ideas, explaining how the ring-shaped mountain wasn't a result of some cataclysmic attack, but instead from the ancients' ultimately failed attempts to defend their society. Ideas come to mind of how an ancient civilization had more advanced technologies, where the circular rock's distinct shape was created by the overwhelming raw firepower of a weapon long lost to time. Giant Zero liked these ideas, where much of these advanced technologies would be a fantastic premise to build off of. Things like runes and sigils could augment our hunter out on the field, or give an in-narrative justification for switch skills or hunter arts or some sort of evolution of those mechanics. Whatever the real meaning behind it, this prominent rock is eye-catching indeed, with Barba Papa Posey ZJ commenting on the parallels to yin and yang. They tied this together with the colorations of the logo and the imagery of the two opposing dragons in Wild's icon, suggesting an ongoing struggle for balance over a piece of shared territory. Drake's Hot Play suggests the rivalry between these two deific dragons are the primary cause of the heavy weather we see in Wild's trailer, and adds that there would likely be other elder dragons or variants to fill out the remaining roster of lesser dragons comprising the rings in the logo. Scribble Crumb had a similar idea, describing a part of the logo as a small egg and using that to liken the size difference to parent and child elder dragons. With these ideas of two superpowers fighting it out, Phoenix Clips draws a comparison to similar rivalries presented between two legendary birds in Pokemon. Similarly, it reminded me of the type of power struggle we saw in Pokemon 2000, where Moltres, Articuno, and Zapdos were all embroiled in conflict with one another. Elemental affinities are a long standby of the Monster Hunter series already, with World introducing turf wars that would not be too far removed from an Elder Dragon turf war on a grand scale, creating inclement weather patterns. Additionally, Dojon One proposes that the ancient technology angle might suggest our apex challenge in Wilds, serving as the final boss fight. They might even take beats from Atal Ka or Narwa, utilizing man-made technologies against us in the fight. This could give us better insight into those technologies, or even the history of the environment Wilds takes place in. And as we've dissected the trailer for nearly four months now, there's been a lot of discussion surrounding the type of world and environment Wilds promises to bring. Open world is pretty much a buzzword around the game, and I've even done a number of videos on the topic already. Reaprieve 635 feels that the stylization of the W in Wild's logo juxtaposed against the W in World's logo implies an instanced open world. Mecha Devzilla remarks about how small a glimpse the trailer really is, regardless of whether it's open world or not. They call attention to the depth and immersion, even mentioning the way that the foliage changes at the end of the trailer suggests seasonal changes. JJ68758 shared similar sentiments, mentioning how Monster Hunter Dose had already done seasons, and they'd love to see this mechanic return. If Capcom's done it once before, they could certainly do it again. I mentioned how the logo itself blends color gradients that could represent biomes and seasons across the world and wilds. And it's in these discussions about the logos that we've gotten some real winners. Some individuals went so far as to create an entire document, organizing their analyses around the trailer and the ideas it could suggest. Zachary Mink 6793 is one such individual where they charted the course of the hunter throughout the trailer, tracked the camera angles, where the storm came from, and even tied them into how this would impact gameplay mechanics. He's even come up with a theory of his own where the imagery of the iconography seems to suggest the cardinal directions on a compass, calling attention to the direction the dragon heads are facing and incorporating a four season cycle into the design. Additionally, Kitten Tactical Warfare 1140 mentions how the way the circles splash in made them think of a mirage or water ripples, the way an oasis would reflect light in the desert. Leo Lionheart 5DK574 goes so far as to suggest this symbolizes the return of water combat, as well as massive elder dragons like Delamadur. Bathtub Toaster shares similar sentiments, explaining that underwater combat is likely to return due to the way the Monster Hunter team has been keen on Legiacris' return for some time now. Toaster also mentions that the icon of the logo could symbolize where exactly we would confront these dragons, one up in the sky and another in the depths beneath the sea. These are just a small glimpse of all the comments and ideas you've shared with me, and shared together. And when we consider that I'm such a tiny YouTuber, it's just a fraction of how invested, loyal, and dedicated the Monster Hunter fanbase really is, able to string together a near-cohesive world all on their own. These ideas are powerful, and is a beautiful demonstration of all the creativity represented by the community as a whole. Instead of just some showcase of how cool our ideas are, we can actually see how our unified voice has had an impact. 
My last video focused on the way the Fifth Fleet influenced the Hunter's Choice poll, discussing our feelings on the results. It's common knowledge that the fifth generation of Monster Hunter games has absolutely propelled the series to the masses. The success of World and Rise has been unprecedented and explosive, helping to cement the franchise as Capcom's crowning achievement. Capcom is aware that the Fifth Fleet dominate the majority of the Monster Hunter fanbase, and how their voice has impacted the polls. But returning to my thoughts on the takeaway that I didn't discuss, let's look at the results of the poll again, where there's something that sticks out like a sore thumb. This infographic breaks down the results to monsters in the top 20 that were introduced in the 5th gen, monsters present in the 5th gen but introduced prior, and monsters exclusive to earlier entries in the franchise. Do you see where I'm going with this? Our good friend Legiacris taking top 3 and Abyssal Legiacris present in the top 20 are the only two monsters that were not featured nor had a variant in the 5th generation. Despite Fivers as the majority, a 3rd generation monster meant to showcase mechanics exclusive to the 3rd generation still managed to make quite the... Splash. Yeah, please, please don't suffer that one, okay? Look, I'm trying. I'm not a comedian here. I'm a theory crafter. I'm doing my best, all right? But it's pretty clear that a dedicated part of the Monster Hunter fanbase wants aquatic combat. Even the team responsible for developing Try acknowledged that there were some Legiacris fans among their ranks. We sent a message. So much so that I'm further convinced we'll be seeing underwater combat make its return in wilds. And Capcom is paying attention. Out of many, we are a strong, vocal, and intelligent community ready to share our ideas with one another. This goes to show how your ideas, your voice, your theories all have a part to play in shaping the world Wilds will introduce. I mentioned on multiple occasions that Capcom is going to need to pull out all the stops if they hope that Wilds will be able to trump world success. And theory crafting? isn't the only application for crowdsourcing ideas. I'm of the mind that Capcom isn't just giving these polls for the mere sake of celebrating the 20th anniversary. Great as that may be, I believe that they're taking beats from the community to help inform the direction of their design choices, choosing to create a product that appeals to its audience. They're curating the Wilds experience in a way that will deliver something to all generations, all while innovating the series' next step forward. It was a risky play and it paid off in spades with World. They're absolutely looking to capture lightning in a bottle with Wilds, requiring them to keep a finger on the pulse up to Wilds' release. So why is this important? Why do the votes matter and how is this going to ultimately affect Wilds? For the answer, we'll need to look no further than the reception around Dragon's Dogma 2, starting off with an overwhelmingly negative review on Steam and working its way up to mixed at present. Two major pain points have risen to the surface since its release. First, micropayment transactions. Now, as a premise, I'm not going to address the economics of rising prices or make this some sort of black and white argument as if in terms of good or bad. Instead, I do want to highlight that micropayment transactions were indeed present in World and Rise, and you should expect that this is going to carry over into Wilds as well. It's pretty much a given and pretty common practice for devs as they seek to secure monetary gain over the course of the long term. Now, Capcom doesn't typically structure their micropayment transactions as pay to win, whale baiting the wallets of their consumers for in-game advantages, but some feel that this is straight a bit too far from the pay for cosmetics micropayment transactions in favor of pay for convenience, even though a number of the mats available for purchase are obtainable in-game. With the words open world tossed around more than breadsticks at Olive Garden, this does give me some concerns about paid fast travel mats in wilds. Second, and more alarmingly, is the optimization. A number of comments leveraged heavy criticisms against the game's inconsistent frame rate and performance issues. This is especially felt on current-gen consoles, but also when observing the specs cited by players where there's a pretty demonstrable need for prohibitively high compute power even when running at 1080p resolutions. Dragon's Dogma 2 is built off of the RE engine, which is Capcom's in-house engine meant to be future-proofed and well-optimized, yet one of the biggest criticisms against it is poor optimization. The backlash has been so overwhelming that Capcom has actually had to come forward and take responsibility for the product they've delivered. The Dragon's Dogma team actually apologized for the inconvenience caused by the state of the game it released, promising bug fixes will be their top priority. While there is mention that the micropayment transaction items can be obtained in-game, the more telling portion of the update acknowledges the feedback on optimization and performance, stating, quote, 
A large amount of CPU usage is allocated to each character and calculating the impact of their physical presence in various areas. In certain situations where numerous characters appear simultaneously, the CPU usage can be very high and may affect the frame rate. However, we are looking into ways to improve performance in the future. The overwhelming outcry from the Dragon's Dogma 2 player base has been heard and Capcom intends to do right by its audience. But there is one big fat problem with this. The RE engine that Dragon's Dogma 2 is built out of is the very same engine Monster Hunter Wilds is being developed from. My very first Monster Hunter Wilds video spoke on this and was met with pretty mixed reception. If you haven't watched it already, I would encourage you to do so. There's a card in the top right. I'll also leave a link to the video in the description if you want to watch it afterward. I had hoped that the RE engine would be able to avoid much of the concerns I voiced in that video, but if multiple NPCs and player characters create CPU-bound bottlenecks in Dragon's Dogma due to the heavy physics computations in the background, what do you see written all over Wild's trailer? Packs, flocks, and herds of endemic life and monsters all on screen at once, each with their own instance of physics calculations relative to each other set of physics calculations leveraged for another instance of the same model on screen. Even the Goss Harag monsters barrel through the herd of pangolins, sending this unlucky fellow tumbling. When you add in the heavy weather and all the physics that come with representing storms and wind in-game, and then calculating those effects against every single instance of a monster on the field? This is looking pretty grim for current gen hardware and we risk seeing the same CPU bottlenecks. Let's be clear, this is not an I told you so, I literally don't want to be right about this. Now at least for Team Sony there is one saving grace we have to look forward to. Insider Gaming has covered a lot of this already. In summary, PlayStation has confirmed a custom-built upscaling technology slated for PS5 later this year, which comes with better clarity in the upscaling, better frame rates, and higher base resolutions. The drawback? It's only confirmed for the PS5 Pro, with no mention of backport to the existing fleet of PS5s and PS5 Slims. And when we look at the specs leaked by Moore's Law is Dead, we can see that the CPU is identical to that of the PS5. Our only benefit here is that the PS5 Pro's alleged high-frequency CPU mode can overclock the CPU by about 10%. This will help mitigate reduced frame rates from CPU bottlenecks in games like Dragon's Dogma 2 and potentially Monster Hunter Wilds, but remember, that's 10% faster clock speed on a Zen 2 architecture nearly 5 years old, with Zen 5 rumored for launch later this year. On the tin, this appears to be bad news for anyone without a top-end CPU, and even worse news for our console-based hunters. We shouldn't need to buy entirely new hardware or an entirely new set of high-end PC components just to have a playable experience. That or the graphical uplift in comparison to Monster Hunter World is going to be pretty minimal to account for the restrictions of current-gen hardware. Remember, the Monster Hunter Wilds trailer was captured on, you guessed it, PC, where these bottlenecks would be significantly less apparent. Anyone could have a buttery smooth gameplay experience on multi-thousand dollar render farm hardware. So this is where I turn to you. If the Monster Hunter community can be so outspoken, so dedicated to this franchise as to all but secure water combat in Monster Hunter Wilds from just the Hunter's Choice poll, then consider just how much more we can use our unified voice to make our expectations known. The overwhelming response from the Dragon's Dogma 2 player base forced Capcom's hand to take action on aspects of their product that translated to a degraded player experience. How they choose to follow through on those promises is yet to be seen, but it will set the precedent for how we can expect them to approach future releases. The deep discussions we've had in the comments proves that there is a wide range of deep thinkers amongst the ranks of hunters across the globe. Let's get these conversations started. If as a community we can craft complex, intricate theories about the Monster Hunter franchise even so far as to tie in lore, mechanics, development history, and Capcom's business choices, then we can craft equally complex, intricate arguments in favor of the way we want Wilds to take shape. Share your concerns, speak to your experiences, and make your voice heard. Are we going to get a product riddled with day one patches and dodgy frame rates? Is Wilds going to be CPU bottlenecked like Dragon's Dogma 2? 
can Capcom iterate on the RE engine in a way that addresses these concerns before WoW's release? Have you played Dragon's Dogma 2 yourself? And will the additional performance of the PS5 Pro make enough difference to avoid much of Dragon's Dogma 2's pitfalls? Jozo Sujimoto has already acknowledged how many of us are deep diving on this trailer, and Capcom knows they've gotten our attention. Not all attention, however, is good, and at the end of the day, business is business. We are the audience, and as consumers of Capcom's content, we hold the power of the purse. We're not obligated to buy this game, there's a lot riding on WoW's release, and certainly some measure of anticipation from Capcom to make sales more than, or at least equivalent to, the paramount success of the fifth generation. If you don't want micropayment transactions, don't buy them. If you don't want an unoptimized game, don't buy it. I would encourage you to vote with your wallet, Hunter, or at the very least, make an informed buying decision. What I don't want to see, on the other hand, is hunters begrudging other hunters how they choose to spend their money. Regardless of where your position falls on the micropayment transaction spectrum, we all want the same thing. A quality game with an enjoyable gameplay experience that delivers on the quality we've come to expect from the Monster Hunter franchise. We're all entitled to our own opinions, meaning hunters who aren't so bothered by performance considerations or micropayment transaction concerns are similarly entitled to spend their money how they see fit. Let's all enjoy the Wilds experience in a way that's meaningful to us and make space to let others do the same. So talk to me. What are your concerns for Wilds? What would be your deal breakers? Or are you ultimately not concerned at all? I'm Jade, and I'm covering as much Monster Hunter Wilds as I can between now and the game's release. On screen is a playlist of all my Monster Hunter Wilds videos to date, and it is never too late to join in the conversation on even older videos. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date, slap that like button, and to all hunters old and new, may the Sapphire Star guide your way. Until the next video, I'll see you in the comments below.